Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Luke Johnson from No Edit, the Humanities Teaching App. And today we're doing a very special interview with the author of this here book, Inscrutable Malice, The Odyssey, Eschatology, and the Biblical Sources of Moby Dick. Everybody knows Dr. Jonathan Cook. He's done many seminars for us so far on Pierre, Moby Dick, Billy Bud, House of Seven Gables, <laughs> and the Confidence Man. How many, am I leaving Israel, anything out? Israel Potter. Israel Potter, yeah, that's right. I might, uh, if I can get his permission, I might, I might start recording what this uh, Melville poem was at Clarell. Yeah, right. Uh, hopefully, I can entice you to take yeah. up a study of that. Yeah. But because um, I'd really like to make an audio book on it. But today, we're going to talk about your physical book. Yeah. Inscrutable Malice, and I have to say, off camera and via my Facebook page and stuff like that, this is one of the most well-researched books I've read. It's a beautiful. Uh, secondary source for anyone who's trying to make it through Melville's um, Moby Dick and it will illumine so many correlations with the Bible and uh, it's uh, the, the prose is brilliant and the research is incredibly deep so I think we should get into the discussion of your text and I I guess to begin what gave you the idea to, to, to write this book <laughs> uh, yeah well first of all thanks so much for doing this um, so this book uh, emerged out of my uh, a bigger project actually that I was working on um, on um, apocalyptic uh, influences on American literature and Melville in particular um, and I was going to do chapters on um, uh, major men American Renaissance writers including Melville and originally I was going to have a chapter on Moby Dick and it would pretty much cover the apocalyptic and the Job uh, kind of theodicy aspects to the book. And as when I was working on this chapter, I realized that this was much bi a much bigger topic than just a chapter. Um, but um, I mean, originally my interest in Melville and apocalyptic ideology came from my um, a book that I wrote on the Confidence Man, which was my doctoral dissertation at Columbia. And that was published in 1996. So, uh, you know, that book left me fascinated by apocalyptic influences on American culture in the 19th century on on major writers like Melville and Hawthorne and Poe. Uh, and so I started working on this larger study and then took time off to develop this one chapter into, a, into a, another book. Uh, and this pretty much started at the beginning of this, you know, 2000s, and uh, continued up until uh, you know publication 2012. Um, so I was, you know, going to the library a lot, um, just sort of letting this whole project evolve, and really teaching myself about. Um, you know, this sort of New Testament and Old Testament scholarship, trying to get a feel for, uh, particularly for the Old Testament, the influence of myth and uh, comparative religion, uh, which uh, for which there's been a lot of work done in the last few decades. I mean, not many literary scholars are aware of this, but there's there's a whole sort of revolution going on in biblical studies, uh, which is utterly fascinating if you. Uh, you know, take an interest in it, particularly if you're a literary scholar and you and you want to make some connections between religion and literature. It's really no have to know what's going on in yeah. this field because it, it doesn't stay stand still. You know, there's always new developments, and a lot of the interpretations that you get from traditional literary scholarship have, are very much a part of biblical scholarship these days. They, they really absorb some of the same ideas and, and philosophies. So so that's kind of how and when I wrote it. Uh, I'd have to say, you know, it's interesting as someone who's done a lot of biblical research like you lately, I mean, it does offer a bit of a Rosetta Stone for decoding a lot of our literature and philosophy. Yeah. Uh, it's really... You know, definite value in it. And I think you were mentioning earlier how you began writing this book in the early 2000s and something I was saying to you um, just 
just moments ago was, you know, as someone who's just written his first book, you know, and finished up my doctoral dissertation, and I can appreciate how much research and how much time it took to do this. And um, I, I think, uh, uh, and I think the audience would like to know a little bit more about the, the backstory about you know, how long it took you to write it, what your process was, where where you wrote it. I mean, just kind of pull back the curtains a little yeah. bit. Yeah, well, you know, I, we, we both live in Northern Virginia. And uh, I came here in the late 90s and sort of was in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years and then came out here in 2001. Um, so I... I, um, you know, I benefited from some of the scholarly libraries in the area, like Georgetown, uh, Library of Congress, George Mason, uh, American University, and pretty much relied on Georgetown to get books. You know, I was a, I had a, um, you know, membership in the library, so I could I could use it whenever I wanted. Occasionally going to the Library of Congress. Um, but so much, as is true today, so much is, uh, you know, more and more is getting put online. So um, you, uh, you really have just this amazing resources available. And for me, it was just keeping track of everything. I mean, in a way, I'm, I didn't have that big of a challenge because I'm, I, my book is, is a close reading of Moby Dick. So I didn't have to deal with several authors and uh, lots of different uh, you know, things to say about these different books. I mean, I'm dealing with one book and just doing a very close reading of the whole structure. And so, um, so I would, I would pretty much, you know, I could sort of, I knew sort of my structure would divide up into uh, different parts of the novel and what the best approach would be after I wrote a general introduction. So I could sort of work on several chapters at a time because I kind of knew what each uh, chapter was trying to say about that particular part of the book. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, you start these things because you're curious, because you enjoy making discoveries, and you want to teach yourself about the subject. Um, of course, in the back of your mind, these days, for anyone, I think, in academia, for particularly for someone like me, is, you know, how am I ever going to get something like this published? I mean, first of all, publishers don't really like that much literary criticism. It doesn't sell very well. Um, and they don't like literary criticism that's very long, you know. They, they like nice short books of 150 pages, you know, minus 300 pages or so. Um, and the question is, how are you going to find a publisher, you know? How, because I'm not following in any particular academic groove. I'm not dropping buzzwords and invoking <laughs> some of the, you know, latest literary theories. I'm pretty much just striking out on my own. And particularly for me, when the, when the economy crashed in 2008, uh, you know, I said to myself, well, there goes my book. You know, how am I ever going to get published if, 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 you know, we're going to uh, face a new depression when, you know, publishers are all going to go bankrupt and, no one is going to have any money, and the last thing they want to do is read literary criticism. So I got very depressed for a while, um, and then uh, after a couple of years when the economy you know, made a bit of a comeback, I realized, well, I can't afford to have done all this work and just let this project sit on a shelf. So then I, I kind of got galvanized into action and sent letters out to publishers and uh, you know as is usually the case you know you send out 25 letters or 30 40 letters and you know one or two people take a little nibble and fortunately I had one press that had done a few Melville books Northern Illinois University Press and and they expressed some interest and I found a sympathetic uh, editor and um, so 
I was lucky, but I had, you know, every step of the way, there are hurdles because even when you have an ed editor interested, you know, you can have readers, and, and I, you know, I had one reader who thought my book was brilliant, and then another reader who thought that it should be half its length um, and didn't like this and that. So the question is, uh, what do you do, you know, when you when you face a situation like that, and how how strong a stand will you take to defend your own work, as opposed to taking out big chunks of things that you that you are convinced are very important. So I, luckily, the publisher went with the opinion of the of the positive reader and ignored the other reader pretty much. <laughs> and uh, so you know, I squeaked by. So you know, it's amazing how sort of perilous the road to getting something out to the public is even you know for something as relatively small as a book of literary criticism i mean well this is how this is how, how all great stuff goes right it's like it's like <laughs> it's, it's an obstacle who, course yeah you have to be put through this rube goldberg machine right and there's sort of this chance happening and for our luckily for us the the positive commentator uh's opinion won the day because there's this is so detail rich and Read this, yeah. this book. You're not just going to learn about. you learning about. Yeah. You're learning about Paradise Lost. You're going to be learning about the relationship that Melville had with Hawthorne. I mean, on and on and on about other religions. Of, you know, that, like you mentioned earlier, the comparative religions. So I'm glad you didn't leave out any of those details. Uh, and I think that's one of the real strengths of the book. And that that's going to be. Yeah. What I was going to ask you is what. You know, I've sort of expressed my opinion about what's so great about the book, but what do you think, in your own estimation, the book accomplishes <laughs> that no other? Well, my uh, the book is it really gives a, a very comprehensive overview of uh, the theological and moral and philosophical underpinnings of this book, which is what. Melville intended it to be understood as, you know, a philosophical, theological drama that was intended to have sort of Shakespearean and Miltonic and Homeric resonances. Uh, I mean, he was going for the gold in terms of, you know, comparisons with the great writers of the West. Um, and that really, you know, it began with the Bible because the Bible was the <clears throat> foundation for American culture, for Western culture, and he was he was using it as a template for his storytelling, which uh, a lot of writers do, uh, and, you know, especially people like Shakespeare and Milton. Um, I mean, there are many books on Shakespeare and the Bible, Milton and the Bible, um, because those were the texts that they grew up on and they sort of provided a moral foundation for their understanding of the world. And, and for Melville, um, this was the world that he was, he was writing in and against, you know. He's writing in 1850, 1851. The country was um, pretty much a, in the midst of a prolonged religious revival called the Second Great Awakening. And uh, Protestantism was the moral law of the land. I mean, it, you know, there were more and more Catholics coming in as immigrants, but they were, you know, creating a lot of uh, stress on the political system. They were immigrants going to cities in New York and Philadelphia, and there was a lot of pushback against them. In fact, there was a whole political party in the 1850s called the Know Nothings who were uh, right. created to fight against the immigrants coming in. Um, so America as a Protestant nation uh, was very much the, the reality when Melville was writing and you know he grew up going to church every Sunday, sometimes twice on Sunday when he was living up in Albany with his uh, near his Dutch reform uh, family of his mother. And so uh, when that happens and when you go to schools and you're learning uh, in, in elementary school about uh, you know, Christian antiquities. I mean, you're learning some Latin, maybe some Greek if you're planning to go to college, but you're mainly, uh, the purpose of college at that point um, still was pretty much to train for the ministry. I mean, 
That, of course, changed later on, but the foundation of colleges in the U.S. was, was pretty much designed to create a, a, a place for, for the clergy to study. Um, so, uh, you know, this was the world that Melville lived in. This was the world that he was writing about in Moby Dick and, 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 and writing against, uh, creating a drama that uh, was challenging some of the basic dogmas of the Judeo-Christian heritage, like the, the goodness of God, the, the idea that the creation is good, you know, based on the first chapter of Genesis. Um, so, uh, I'm, my book is pretty much a reminder that this is the book that Melville was writing. It's not the book that contemporary academic critics, uh, see when they impose some of their own favorite, you know, ideologies on the book. It's, it's pretty much how it was created. And for me, it's, it's really kind of trying to take the, patina of age off of this beautiful painting. I think of it as sort of removing the uh, the grime from, uh, you know, the Sistine ceiling or something like that. It's <laughs> taking uh, this, 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 you know, this aging effect off and looking at the vibrancy of the colors that you see underneath. Uh, it, it really is a, a vibrant book. I mean, very so much alive with the, you know, intellectual and dramatic um, action from uh, from the narrator Ishmael um, so uh, and you know I also wanted to make readers uh, aware that uh, they really need to read the whole book I mean so many people pick it up pick up pick up Moby Dick and they, they get to the wailing chapters right right uh, and uh, they suddenly realize that they're going to have to sort of wade through a whole bunch of information about whaling uh, before they're going to get back to the dramatic action of the book. So yeah, that was uh, one of the great the great words that I learned from your book was the study of whales. I believe it's called cetology. Is cetology, that, that right? yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> a Latin word for whale. Yeah. So I, you know, another thing is I, I show that the study of the whale is integral to this vision that Melville has about the cosmos and the creation. Sort of whales are, are sort of these archetypal creatures who are, you know, first of all, Moby Dick is a whale, so you have to have, know something about the whales to understand this, this character of the novel. Um, but in keeping with the book as a, as a compilation of all kinds of genres, I mean, part of this book is really an amazing uh, study of natural history of the time uh, inserted into the novel as, as a sort of um, manifestation of, of your, the idea that this is a sort of encyclopedic index to the creation, to the world, just like the Bible tries to be a whole history of the world from the creation to the apocalypse, right? Moby Dick is trying to be a whole um, survey of the cosmos uh, from beginning to end, from, uh, you know, humans and natural creatures in, included. Um, so, but the, again, the whale is incorporated into the biblical vision because whales form a part of the Bible as sort of sea monsters and sea creatures, as sort of archetypal, what I call chaos monsters. Um, and... Um, yeah, because you have all the episodes of Leviathan and yeah. Jonah, Jonah and the whale, right? Yeah, and and the Psalms as well, and and uh, the prophets. Um, you know, the the creation myth from the ancient world, from uh, you know Mesopotamia, is that a hero fights a monster and creates civilization, and and in many cases the monster is a sea monster, and that sea monster is correlated with the whale as the main, uh, you know, the largest sea creature in the world. Um, so Melville uh, was was really, um, you know, drawing parallels between the modern whale, the demonized whale of, of Ahab, which is Moby Dick, and then the the whale as industrial product for Ishmael. 
um, he's tying in these creatures to the biblical vision of the of the monster that you know sometimes the whale and say the Psalms and Psalm 104 is is a creature who's within the creation right he's playing around in the ocean just like any other sea creature and then in other areas the whale is the archetypal enemy the sea monster has to be overcome for there to be creation uh, of the cosmos right so he's the chaos who has to be eliminated to create cosmos which means order of course in, in Greek and then there's always the threat that you know the, the, the chaotic creature has not been totally disabled he's going to come back you know he's on the fringes of your community is going to erupt into it, which is kind of what happens in Moby Dick. This chaos monster appears, and um, Ishmael and, and Ahab are confronted with it, and Ahab, you know, envisions it as a as an example of what was the the biblical monster that he has to kill to eliminate evil, right? Because he allegorizes the whale into sort of the embodiment of evil because it's hurt him personally right but and then again that, he's that was another one of the great virtues of your book is really drawing out the condition of ahab i i think uh you know i mean you really dwell on his physical torment and how he projects that onto yeah to moby dick and i i'm not sure it was as obvious to me just because other parts of the novel um caught my attention but I think that that that's one of the great things that you did in this book was really to get inside the mind of Ahab yeah well he's you know he's sort of a messianic figure because he thinks that he is there to conquer evil but he has been so um, obsessed with this idea that he himself has become tainted and becomes an evil agent in his own right by assuming this unauthorized power over his men causing their death um, and making a pact with Fadala, you know, who's kind of the um, uh, Mephistopheles character in this Faustian drama um, to, um, um, you know, kill the white whale. Um, so, and the other thing about Ahab is that, uh, uh, you know, he's a he's just like Ishmael, but probably more so. He's a composite creation, you know, of the figure of Job and Milton Satan and Prometheus and uh, a bunch of other people but he uh, one of the interesting things for me was realizing that his wound you know this torturing pain that he has from his leg uh, his lost leg rather um, corresponds to what today is called phantom limb uh, syndrome you know which is right. only really um, discovered in the later 19th century uh, by a guy named Ed, uh, Weir Mitchell, you know, this um, neurologist um, from Philadelphia who was actually a novelist as well. You know, he's a friend of, uh, uh, you know, uh, William James and some of the other people in the later 19th century. Uh, but this phantom limb syndrome, I mean, Melville really nailed it. He he explains exactly this bizarre sensation of having pain where the missing limb is. And for Ahab, he extrapolates the idea that this is a, 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 a sadistic creator who did this, you know, that it shows that pain can exist without a physical body, which to him proves that there has to be a hell because that's how... You know, you can be tortured with your soul in hell when you don't have a body. It's on the analogy of this of this phantom limb uh, idea. Um, so uh, it, it's something that um, researchers today are just really getting to know how you know the actual neurological basis for this idea. But for Melville, of course, it was the the mystery of how you can have pain when you're when you have a missing limb. Um, so, you know, it's all kinds of things like that that, that fascinated me uh, as part of the characterization of Ahab. Because, you know, when you read the book, when I, I think when I read it in high school, Ahab is this operatic figure, and it, it all seems so unreal, you know. How could anyone be talking to uh, the lightning in the midst of a storm and saying all kinds of crazy things about 
God and the Father and whatnot. Um, so you, I mean, you have to sort of step back and realize that, you know, Melville was not writing a totally realistic novel. It, you know, it's, it's symbolic realism. So every once in a while, the symbolism pushes ahead of the realism. And um, uh, you have to sort of be ready for that and understand why he was doing that. And, you know, it pretty much ties in with the Job idea that this is a character who is complaining about divine injustice very vocally, just like Job did over and over in uh, you know, his speeches to his three um, comforters. So some, some friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, sorry, I, sorry, I was curious about, when I was doing my dissertation on Kierkegaard, I, uh, and it's a little, little, it's kind of a curveball here, but when I was doing my dissertation, I started to feel like I was doing some sort of mind or identity meld with Kierkegaard. Did you ever uh, find, <laughs> yeah, find yeah. yourself uh, questioning where the uh, boundaries between yourself and Melville <laughs> were? Yeah, that's interesting because... Uh, <laughs> I think when you really closely identify with an author like that, it's it's bound to happen. Yeah, I I, I think about my own life because uh, you know I grew up in the you know Malvo was born in New York City, grew up in New York and then Albany, so you know pretty much in the Hudson Valley. He visited Boston uh, to see his uh, grandfather and to see some of his in-laws. Well, you know I was born in Washington DC but grew up in the Hudson Valley just north of New York and uh, you know I have family up the river near Albany and I spent a lot of time around Pittsfield where he lived from 1850 to uh, 1863 so I know where he lived and I visited his houses I know his uh, uh, his his uh, you know milieu and um, um, you know I too spent time on ships when I was younger in college I spent two summers working as a deckhand on the Mississippi River um, really? yeah to uh, make some money um, and um, uh, so yeah there, there are certain similarities of background but uh, and uh, I mean, in terms of basic temperament, yes, I, I, I really relate to Melville's style of writing. To me, he has a beautiful style. Um, he's a real wordsmith, but he's also incredibly um, um, voracious in terms of incorporating other writers and traditions, right? Intellectually voracious individual. Um, right. So you have to sort of identify with that, and, and you know I do because it, it just teaches you so much about the world to, um, or the world of that writer to read everything that they wrote and 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 and, and what influenced them as well. Um, so yeah, strong identification. Um, I'm trying to think if I had any dreams that sort of led me to <laughs> so, some so, of my uh, insights. <laughs> But, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Did, did he find you as a kindred spirit? Was this someone imposed upon you, or no? I found I found I, him because uh, it's it's very odd. Because I have to say, you know, Moby Dick. I read him in high school. I read him in college, and I thought, well, this is interesting. But then again, you know, as I said, it just seemed too operatic to me. Um, and I hadn't read any of his other work, or I guess I'd read Billy Budd too in college. Um, but it was really after college when I started reading him in the early 80s when he, all of his complete work started coming out in those beautiful Library of America editions. And I read through a lot of his early fiction. I said, oh my God, this guy is amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, he's not at all like uh, what I thought he was originally. So. No, when I went to graduate school, I naturally gravitated towards him and chose the confidence man for a dissertation uh, topic and, um, you know, so spent a lot of time tracking a lot of things about that book and how it synthesizes the whole different vision of 
of America in the 1850s. Um, the world of a you know a riverboat, not a not a ship in, in the ocean. Um, so uh, yeah, so you know you really need a lifetime to really interact with an author because you never know what you're gonna discover at one point. You just have to keep. Uh, investigate right so uh, you know I personally I don't think any high school student should read Moby Dick because they're not just not going to get that much out of it um, but I think it's a book that you you can read in college and then it becomes more resonant maybe in your mid 20s or later 20s and then you have to read it a couple of times and then you maybe have to listen to it at least once um, with this this guy who does he did a recorded books version William Hooten's does a really good version of it um, and uh, so it's it's really something that you have to grow up with um, not when you're young but you know when you when you're mature enough to really understand some of the philosophical issues that, that you know Melville was dealing with or you have to have a better teacher to introduce these things because I never I, I don't remember any you know getting a real clue to what to look for I mean when I was in college the one of the big influences on it was uh, you know this political influence uh, William Heimert I'm sorry Alan Heimert from at Harvard wrote a famous article about uh, Moby Dick and the American political tradition, right? S saying that Melville was caught up in the debates uh, of 1850, 1851 over, you know, the compromise of 1850. That you know he was he was sort of some of the language of the time made its way into the book uh, from the political realm, and that has led to a whole school of criticism saying the book uh, shows Melville engaged with the whole debate over Manifest Destiny and westward expansion, whatever. Well, I, you know, he was to a certain extent, but I think it really, that happened later on by the mid-1850s, not in 1850, 1851, because at that point, all he wanted to do was to, you know, write a book to rival Shakespeare and to rival Milton or to rival Hawthorne, whom he had just met, right? He was... He was much more engaged in sort of literary philosophical ideas than any kind of reaction to the political situation of the country at the time. Right. Um, ask, but I think what I should what I should delve into now is this um, the issue of why Protestant Christianity was such a subject. From Melville, and if you could, where Melville actually ended up in his his religious ideology, or where do you think he was? Because I mean, points in Moby Dick. I've heard a lot of people talk about him as being a pantheist or a polytheist. What Melville actually ended up? Okay, so um, you know, he's born in eighteen nineteen. Um, he was living in New York City. His parents, his father was a Unitarian. So, I mean, he was, he was, uh, you know, getting a religious education in church and at home, but um, it really didn't become that important to him until his father died in 1832, uh, when he was 12, and that happened when they had moved to Albany in 1830, and they. He was surrounded by um, the world of uh, the Dutch Reformed Church, which was very strongly Calvinist, right? Unitarians, of course, like his father, were were not at all, you know, Calvinists. Um, they were moving beyond that. So religion became more important for Melville, and uh, so he really, you know, he went to church probably twice a day for a while in the 1830s. And heard a lot of about, about God and predestination and uh, you know punitive um, condemnation of sinners and uh, you know the idea of predestination sort of got him 
thinking, and I think there was a there was sort of a natural revolt for him because he, I think he saw his family facing disasters like the death of the father, and who was you know a very gentle, benevolent man, although he, he messed up his business career terribly, um, and um, so Melville saw his father's death and his father's bankruptcy. And then, of course, his brother went bankrupt, uh, running uh, the family fur business uh, in 1837, right? He tried to make a comeback by continuing what the father was doing, which was um, dealing with furs, because living in Albany, you had access to a lot of, you know, beaver pelts and things like that from up north. And uh, so Melville saw the struggles of his family, and they said, you know, do we really deserve that from... A, a just and benevolent deity. And then, of course, you know, he struggled to find a career uh, for a few years. He, he tried school teaching. He didn't make any money out of that. This was in the country was in a in a depression at this point in the late 1830s. And, uh, and then finally, he went to sea at the end of 1840, right, early 1841 went to the Pacific and saw Christian missionaries um, forcing religion on these fairly contented Polynesian peoples, you know, and bringing, uh, being the sort of at the forefront of um, diseases that these people were not immune to and um, coming along with the exploitation of native peoples and their, and their wealth and their women. And so he saw the downside of Christianity in its missionary incarnation. And so this seed of revolt was you know, gradually nurtured in him in the 1840s. Although he, I mean, the part of him was very devout and admired the example of Christ and, you know, thought the New Testament was a miracle of moral clarity, you know. Um, but then he saw what was happening in the world, and he, well, he saw what happened in his own life, and he became, uh, you know, a rebel by the time he wrote Moby Dick. And he'd also read people like Pierre Bale and uh, Montaigne, and so he, he had been sort of inculcated with this idea of religious skepticism. Um, and uh, it shows up in Moby Dick, it shows up in Pierre, and I think throughout the 1850s he's writing literary works which are profoundly questioning different aspects of Christianity, you know, one, one thing or another. I mean, Moby Dick is pretty much focused on the Old Testament, Pierre is pretty much focused on the New Testament, uh, but a lot of his short fiction is, has more of a sort of New Testament focus. Um, and so you really have to, you know, call him a skeptic in the 1850s. And then um, by the 1860s and 70s, uh, he's kind of inching back to a sort of a more neutral position. Um, I mean, he never became a devout believer, but he, he uh, uh, for instance, he, he started, you know, when he moved back to New York in 1863, he eventually joined the church of his wife, the Unitarian Church there. So he went to church, and uh, he, I think he pretty much embraced the moral vision of Christianity, but he'd given up anything to, to do with the metaphysical, you know, aspects like the resurrection and miracles and things like that. But he, he strongly endorsed the moral vision of, of Christ as well. But he, of course, he compared that to what he saw in the U.S. and we saw in the world, and he, that's the source of a lot of his anguish and the, the source of a lot of his fiction as well, because, you know, people who read Moby Dick, mostly if they're the general public, they don't realize that he wrote a huge novel in verse, Clarel, you know, in 1876 about a bunch of pilgrims going around the Holy Land, well, pilgrims, you know, in quotation marks, a bunch of Americans and other nationalities visiting the Holy Land in a four-day uh, circuit and talking about religion in the modern world. And uh, this is really the consummation of his religious vision because it, it shows him as an anguished individual who 
you know, who would like to believe, but he can't believe. On the other hand, he admires a lot of things about Christianity, and he criticizes a lot of things, and he, he just doesn't know what you can replace it with. He has this kind of sense that this is the last religion we'll ever have, and, you know, it's either this or nothing, and if there's nothing, then we're, we're losing a lot. He can't, he can't make the step out of his, the world that he grew up in. You, you know, who's, uh, you know, it sounds a little bit like the perspective of, did you, do, have you ever watched, I'm sure you have, but do you ever watch like Bergman films, like The Seventh Seal or whatever? Mm, yeah, I'm, thinking yeah. specific, I'm thinking specifically of like the knight in The Seventh Seal who's like, why can't I tear this idea of God from my mind? Yeah. Just wants to be done with religion, but yeah. can't be done. Yeah. I, has anyone ever tried to do sort of a, a parallel analysis of Bergman and Melville? Or, are they, no, are they kindred never... spirits? I, I don't know much about Bergman's life personally, but yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting people in this tradition. Um, from what my opinion, or my, what I've read is that, you know, it, it's kind of like this idea of psychological imprinting. Once this is imprinted on you, you know, right. if you, if you, um, if you have little, uh, little ducks, you know, and you uh, you take away their mother and you give this sort of weird shaped creature to them, they'll, they'll, they'll learn that that's what the mother looks like and, and even though it's not a real one. So it's imprinted in their brains and, and religion is kind of like that. If you grow up with this uh, sense that this is the way the world should be and this is what who God is and you have a whole Bible to explain the world to you, uh, you really can't ever give it up, even if you don't really believe in it anymore. So what you feel is regret for the loss of this system of meaning, right? On the other hand, you have people who feel relief in giving it up because they don't feel imprisoned by these narrow ideologies anymore, people who've sort of thrown aside their fundamentalism. So it, it's sort of a weird dichotomy of regret and relief, and you never know which side of the coin someone is going to fall on. Um, uh, but Melville was definitely one of the people who, who felt the regret and never quite thought his way out of the, out of the Christian paradigm, you know. Uh, but there, just, there's, yeah, there's some other interesting work, though, on this, because this was the same problem in Europe. A lot of people were facing the same issues. Um, uh, there's some interesting literature on this. Arthur Kessler you know, uh, wrote about this in some of his fiction as well. Um, so there's a sort of minority tradition of, of people who, who, who are in the same boat about feeling that, you know, they, they can't let go of religion, but they have to find some kind of substitute for it uh, that's never going to work as well, but they can't do anything else. Yeah. I think an interesting foil to uh, Melville would be Nietzsche. You know, as, as yeah. being this individual that falls down more on the liberation side, yeah. which I use in air quote, is yeah. You know, well, I think it's not, it's not like Nietzsche was an uncomplicated character. You know, it was yeah. pretty a pretty yeah, definitely a lot of interesting comparisons with Nietzsche there, especially w when you think about Pierre, because there's a chapter in Pierre that sounds exactly like you know Nietzsche's Antichrist talking about the physically destructive. Uh, effects of Christianity on the body, you know, this asceticism that is so uh, evident in, in, you know, from the tradition of St. Paul, and there's a chapter in Pierre where the narrator talks about Pierre at his writing desk, you know, freezing in the middle of winter and without uh, any adequate clothing and writing a book and his ink freezing in his Inkwell, <laughs> and he says there, you know, uh, I forget who he's addressing, but, you know, see your victim here, you know, austerity or whatever. Uh, so definitely a lot of uh, comparative work that could be done with Nietzsche and, and Melvin. <laughs> And I hadn't thought about the I hadn't thought about the the Christian effects on the body in a while. What's interesting is <laughs> I found out last night that Hugh Jackman is playing St. Paul <laughs> in a movie. Oh, really? So Wolverine is going to be playing uh, uh, Paul. <laughs> so at least I'll have a pretty jacked St. Paul. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. um, I wonder what that is going to be part of. 
Uh, it probably won't be that biblically reliable, yeah. but I think it's funny. Um, I, yeah, I mean, the, one of the questions is like, why has it more biblical sort of criticism or, or, or exploration of these Protestant topics in Melville occurred? Is it just because academics are so secular that they become <laughs> like uh, religiously illiterate? I mean, they don't even yeah. know? That's part of it, yes, definitely. Um, they never really had it around them growing up, and they don't know it, and they, they just are sort of oblivious of it, um, which is it's too bad, and it also doesn't do justice to the writers for whom religion is, is important. So if you want to know something about the writer, you got to study their, their milieu, and that's certainly true for mid-19th mid century American writers. And it's also kind of disturbing because there have been some really great um, people who worked in this genre. Uh, I'm thinking of Northrop Fry and, um, um, uh, you know, Robert Alter, who's done these wonderful translations of the Bible, also has, has done collections of essays about the Bible and religion. So uh, Robert Alter is one of the writers I really, you know, he's a, a hero for me in terms of the work he has done in this field. And, you know, Harold Bloom uh, oh, yeah. has some oh, provocative oh, provocative stuff. But, I mean, he's all over the map. Uh, but well, he definitely thinks this is a vital part of Western tradition and you need to know it, right? So, you know, some of his work, I think, is, is off the deep end. But, you know, a lot of his work is very stimulating and massively informed with his knowledge um i can't believe we've i can't believe we've never talked about harold bloom before i mean i that's a whole that's a that's a topic for another day but yeah I, well he you know, he sees the bible the influence of the bible unfortunately he has a his sort of approach to literature is deliberately sort of amoral so he doesn't you know some of his um conclusions are are strange and sort of peculiar, but he's always provocative, and he also, you know, knows so much that he's always able to sort of bring things in to, to sort of rev up the debate because his comprehension includes so so many different writers, uh, and he knows the importance of tradition and influence uh, on writers. So. So yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to spark some kind of mini revival uh, of this subject. I mean, I as I mentioned, I published a book with a, another guy, Brian Yothers, a collection of essays on Melville and religion, uh, just this past year, and um, we'll see how much attention that gets. But it's meant to, you know, show that this field is not nearly as active as it really should be. Well, but on the other hand, yeah, hopefully we can turn on a lot of people to yeah. this stuff. Like that, you've definitely got me all exercised about it. I mean, well, the other hand, on the other hand, I was just I went to the uh, Melva conference uh, in London back in June. You know, the eleventh uh, International Melville Conference. Here's the program, and I gave a paper on Israel Potter, and and the Book of Ecclesiastes, and I was probably one of about. You know, half a dozen people who are talking about Melville and religion, but everyone else was um, on to other topics like, you know, post-colonialism and queer theory and race theory. Um, so we're not really creating that much of a critical mass yet in the Melville Society. Of course, I don't know what that indicates, but that's that's sort of the professional organization for Melville scholars. So just like, you know, most academia today, um, there's a lot of different approaches, but they tend to be sort of politicized, ideological, theoretical, um, rather than dealing with historical or archival or biographical criticism um, that, you know, that I embrace more and the traditional scholars yeah. You know, work in. 
that's I, I yeah I think it's one of the strong virtues of the book. That's why I appreciate your writing so much. So, you know, we've talked about this a little throughout our entire conversation, but you know, say about this about us today in America in 2017. I mean, it's a very it's a very unusual time in America right yeah. now, right? Yeah. Um, so. And I'm sure you're doing a lot of in-process thinking as you track current events and geopolitical events and and everything else. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, where do you in points of intersection between what's going on here yeah. and our culture and what Melville's doing? Yeah. Well, I think you you sort of have to be careful not to overgeneralize, but it's always worth discussing it periodically, what the, yeah. what the impact is. So, uh, I mean, for a lot of the beginnings of the war on terror, you know, the idea was that Ahab is the U.S. going against um, bin Laden, say, you know, that the idea of finding, rooting out evil in the world has been a, a big American preoccupation. Um, and sometimes we've been good at it, and sometimes we've been pretty bad at it. So, um I mean, that's one of my points in the book is that Ahab really, uh, he grows out of the culture of the 1840s and 50s because it was an era of moral reform. And all these organizations were started to, um, you know, eliminate drinking and to eliminate slavery and to re remediate poverty and um, illiteracy. Um, and, um, um, you know, all the sort of social ills of the time uh, were thought to be remediable by organizing and publishing and doing things, being sort of activist in a, in a very strongly sort of evangelical Protestant manner. So the idea of eliminating evil in the world was very much of in the air at this time, and, and someone like Ahab sort of is the ultimate embodiment of that. Of course, he himself is an embodiment of evil in his obsession with evil as in a personal affront to himself, you know. So um, I think Mel Melville is showing that, you know, you have an obsession with evil, but then that evil can be manifested within you, you yourself when you demonize people for things that don't deserve it. I mean, I only have to think of our president today who is obsessed with the evil of the Islamic terror, right? But then he himself <laughs> is so obviously, uh, you know, has all of these fascistic evil tendencies to repress uh, any kind of free speech and, and uh, you know, uh, equality of races and things like that. So the the obsession with evils can sometimes go within an evil personality. On the other hand, you know, we all have to recognize the evil in the world like Ishmael does, right? He he recognizes it, but then he sees it as a relative phenomena that we have to uh, accept because it makes us a more mature individual, but and we have to resist it, but we're never going to eliminate it, right? It just is going to pop up all over the world. But that doesn't mean that we should be corrupted by it. Right. Um, so we have to we have to defend those liberal values that Ishmael uh, believes in, which you know is pretty much skepticism towards any kind of absolutist vision of the world, which is what. Uh, what uh, Ahab imposes on, on his, uh, uh, you know, on the Pequod. Um, it, the reminds other, yeah. the, yeah. it reminds me of that Nietzsche quote, uh, something to the effect of, when you stare into the abyss, you've got to be careful that it yeah, doesn't right. stare back at you or something. Back at you, exactly. Yeah, I was, that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, the other, the other important aspect of Melville's work today, of course, is the respect for the environment you know there's so much sort of um, uh, messaging you can get from Moby Dick about you know respecting the whale as this miracle of creation and the oceans as this 
realm of infinite wonder um, that uh, and the and the fact that the ocean is also a very capricious element you know it can be beautiful one day and turn into a deadly storm the next day right so we have to have respect and also wonder over the the world that we live in um, and you know we're doing not doing a very good job of either of those of those things right now um, so you know so the there's moral, a, yeah yeah there's a great there's a great critique about um, the fanatical piety of slaying foreign dragons right and then there's this ecological message as well yeah it's absolutely fantastic yeah well you know whaling was an it was a, a very you know it was like the oil business today I mean it was the leading business for fuel of the mid 19th century right all the lamps in America were were or most of them were it was it was the high-grade oil you know whale oil and um, you know you can burn tallow animal fat but it didn't give nearly as good a flame so this was an industry that you know Melville worked in and he accepted that fact on the other hand if you read Moby Dick you see him has as noticing the incredible brutality and cruelty of killing these whales and you know showing yourself the master of creation so there's a sort of dual consciousness going on there um, in his understanding that this is the way the industry works, but then again, it's a horrible industry. Um, so um, he he could not really envisage an economy based on petroleum because it, it didn't exist at the time. You know, sure. it was only only discovered in the U.S. in the late 1850s. So that was the way the the you know the world worked when he was a whaler himself and 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 writing about it um did, did melville know about dinosaurs <laughs> yeah that that's that's, that's I, that an would interesting have point yes the you know the first uh creatures identified um as dinosaurs were were being discussed you know in the 1830s and 40s um yeah. There is, um, you know, a footnote about this dinosaur that has been dug up in Alabama, um, and they, you know, they were really kind of mystified about what these creatures were. They thought they were maybe before the flood. They were antediluvian creatures. Right, right. There wasn't a firm sense of how old they were. Of course, they couldn't date them, but they were beginning to except the fact that you know the idea of extinct animals went against the whole christian uh, natural theology of the time which says that you know creatures shouldn't go extinct there was a creation and everything was there and you know that's there permanently because god made it right so only with the origin of species in 1859 did people start to realize that you know, species have a reason to go extinct, and and they have there's a reason for them to evolve into new species, right? Because you, there was a resistance to accepting the idea of extinction, unless you put these creatures say before the flood somehow. I don't know. I, I would I would I would push back on that a little bit. I wouldn't say that extinction challenges God's plan, but well, that's what they believe. I mean, that was the yeah. Well, oh, that may have been yeah yeah. I mean, that may have been what they believe, but I'm just like if God wanted to. Animal to go extinct, you can make it go extinct. Yeah, right. You know? uh, but if that's what they believed, I mean, that's, that was that's their, the religion. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the the there were controversies at the time. I mean, Richard Owen um, was at the I think the British Museum, um, who was the great expert on dinosaurs, uh, but also a very religious man. Um, so. Uh, it was really after the Civil War that the science of, you know, dinosaurs really evolved in the U.S. especially. I feel like Melville would have been totally fascinated with dinosaurs. 
Yeah. Uh, if you knew more about them. I mean, I, I, I feel I feel like an alternative history coming up here, <laughs> you know, reimagining Moby Dick with dinosaurs or something like that. Yeah. Two sensibilities. <laughs> but I, well, I find it amusing. His world, though, was, you know, was still pre-Darwinian. I mean, the world he grew up with was was um, based on biblical, the truth of the creation, you know, tr creationism. And, uh, you know, he read science. He read um, um, Chambers' as vestiges uh, of, of uh, creation, as creation, which was the big book in 1844 about um, how life evolved according to its own scientific laws. But the idea was it's, it's still a sort of Lamarckian idea in that creatures sort of will their own changes right. to the environment. Um, but it was a very influential book, and it, it shows a whole uh, history of creation from the formation of the solar system to the evolution of, uh, of, of life on Earth. And uh, so, and Melville read that. It influenced one of his early novels called Marty. Um, and it's really a mystery. And, and Melville read Darwin's Journal of Researches, you know, his first book about his um, Voyage of the Beagle. But we don't know exactly when he would have read Origin of Species, but he, it's, it's certain that he did read it. Um, but there's no record of him actually uh, owning a copy or, you know, mentioning it. He, he mentions it in Clarel, but not very directly. I mean, he mentions Darwin at the very end. Well, being uh, such a learned man, I'm sure he was familiar with the idea. I mean, even yeah. Erasmus... Erasmus Darwin was kicking around the idea. Yeah. I think that planted the seed for Charles. And I mean, to be honest, I mean, the idea of evolution has been around for a long yeah. time. Yeah, right. I remember reading Aristotle, and Aristotle like entertains it and then rejects it. So, um, yeah. I yeah. Don't, where where we where we like develop like a lot of our modern concepts of science. I, it's sort of sometimes it seems pretty arbitrary where we decide that that idea came into existence. Like yeah. like for instance like evolution of the solar system idea, I mean, you can see traces of that in yeah. Egyptian culture. You know, I was reading um, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the other night, and it's it's right it's it's right there. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's the, the ideas have not been, you know, formulated in, in modern ways to. Yeah, um, right. But, right. yes, I, I agree. Um, so the evolution, the idea of evolution was in the air when Melville was was a young man, and uh, he was aware of that. But when Origin of Species came out and really changed the landscape, um, he was he had already finished uh, with his career as a novelist, right? He published his last novel in 1857. Origin of Species comes out in 1859. We don't hear from uh, Melville again until he published his collection of Civil War poetry, Battle Pieces, in 1866. And then he publishes Clarel, this long novel in verse, in 1876. And he does mention Darwin right at the end of this poem. And he has one of his characters in the poem is a, is a guy named Margoth, who's a geologist. And he's made to look like a jerk. Um, because he has such a sort of reductionist idea about the world. He's always going around with his hammer, knocking on stones and making uh, sort of stupid remarks about um, how, you know, geology is going to solve all the world's problems. Uh, so he's made to look like a very limited, um, blinkered individual in a way that you know, it's kind of. If I was a scientist, I would be very bothered to to read this. You know, because it doesn't make science look very good. But it was sort of the romantic of image of science. You know, the Wordsworthian idea that you know we kill to dissect. You know, you you get rid of the organic, vital principle to be able to study something scientifically. Right. Oh man, I could go on about this stuff forever. Why don't we? I, I we're we're over oh, an yeah. hour. So yeah, we should probably bring it to a close here. Um, yeah. And but something in closing about this 
the, the reception that the, your book has received in the scholarly community and, yeah. and what the future and present are for you in, in terms of research. Yeah. Okay, so the book came out in 2012. Um, I got two or three really glowing reviews, which I really was happy about. I got some nice feedback from a few individuals personally. You know, I included my email address on the back uh, book jacket if anyone wanted to tell me their opinion. Of course, you never hear from <clears throat> very many people. Plus, libraries tend to take the jackets off of books before they catalog them. Um, I did get a not a very nice review from the Melville Society publication Leviathan, which kind of surprised me. But it was written by an older scholar who was, I think his main point was, you know, you can't say this because I didn't say it, you know, sort of. <laughs> and so how come you're not giving me more attention, right? How come you're breaking out of the world the stuff that I said, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, if you're not making people angry, you're you're, you're not doing it right, right? <laughs> yeah. So that was that was very kind of infuriating. Uh, but otherwise, I count on you know just building up slowly more readers. Um, it's just a little disheartening how little impact one particular book of literary criticism has in the overall scheme of things. If you're not, you know, a big name academic. Um, but I just, you know, things like this, what we're doing today is, I hope, will be helpful to bring the book to a bigger audience. Oh, yeah, and, and we, um, should tell people, we should tell people where they can get it. I mean, I mean, obviously, you can get it on Amazon, and that we should talk about what, what your email, what, what's your email address again? It is jcookinscrutable at gmail.com. Right. So J, C to OK, inscrutable. <clears throat> and, and this is like you mentioned earlier. This is from Northern Illinois Press, and you can go check that out at www.niupress.niu.edu. And I imagine yeah. you can. They sell copies of this. So you can get it. Um, I, and yeah, I should say that I did get a nice acknowledgement uh, in 2014. I was asked to give a, a keynote address at a, uh, a conference on religion and literature. I went down to San Antonio, and there were about 100 people there. Um, and I talked about uh, Moby Dick and 21st century theodicy, um, a different topic and an essay that I hope to publish in the near future. <clears throat> so that was nice. Um, and um, as far as other work goes, I, I have a whole other book that I'm trying to get published now. Uh, that was the book I was originally working on when I started <laughs> this project on Moby Dick. Uh, it's going to be called Harbingers of the Millennium. Um, uh, you know, the apocalyptic imagination in American romantic writing and antebellum culture. So it's going to be a huge survey. And uh, I'm going to be sending out letters very soon, really, to publishers, and you know we'll see what happens there. But I'm also I'm keeping up with a bunch of articles on all kinds of other subjects, including Melville and religion. Um, I have you know something came out recently on on Billy Budd in a collection. I have a, an essay on Melville's visit to London coming out next spring. Um, and um, a book on Melville's Civil War poetry coming out um, at some point, I hope in the next year or two, um, that grew out of a, a conference 2013 on Melville um, and Whitman and the Civil War. Uh, so, you know, lots of other things in the pipeline. It's in, it's uh. I, I, I mean, it, it's like I said, it's an inspiration, man, to, to read your book and to hear about all the projects that you have going on. So, again, yeah. for talking about all this stuff today, and, and thank you for teaching me and so many others about temporaries. And I guess we should just bring this to a close and we'll talk yeah. for a second about what we want to do next. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. Okay, thank you.